And so I want to introduce what I'm going to say by saying, first of all, there are three reasons why I'm delighted to be here. First, because, as you've already heard, I'm always wanting to do anything I can for the Christian Institute. I believe it is doing a vital work, and anything I can do in a small way to help advance that work and encourage the folk involved, I will gladly do. The second reason is I'm always glad of the opportunity of speaking about John Newton. When I wrote my biography of John Newton many years ago now, I said I went to sea with John Newton. I lived John Newton for a while, uh, and I have a huge uh, I have a huge sense of indebtedness to his, the quality of his life and all that he, his life challenges us in. And the third reason is because you in your wisdom, or the Christian Institute in its wisdom, have decided to call this building the John Newton Centre. And I hope this evening I'll be able to give you the reasons why that is a very wise decision, uh, and particularly how the relationship with these two men uh, Wilberforce and Newton ties in together. Now I work through a very close uh, script. It may not be obvious I'm doing that, but I have to because I, I, there are just so many things I would want to tell you about him. I'd, I'd never get halfway through his life if I didn't otherwise. So I have to discipline myself all the time not to tell you those things that are constantly coming into my mind and I think they really ought to know this. So John Newton, 1725 to 1807. In the early part of 1744, the French fleet was becoming increasingly aggressive in the Channel and King George II grew alarmed. The British Navy was always short of sailors. After all, who in his right mind would volunteer to be treated like an animal and suffer the butchery of 18th century naval warfare for just 24 shillings a month? That's £1.20 in modern money especially when you could earn at least twice that amount if you were in the merchant service. And the government's answer to the shortage of recruitment was the infamous press gang. As part of the war effort, on Saturday the 25th of February 1744, a day of strong gales with snow, First Lieutenant T Thomas Ruffin delivered to Captain Carteret of HMS Harwich, anchored just off Sheerness in Kent, eight impressed men one of whom was John Newton. A merchant sailor was always a prime target of the press gangs, and his bandy legs, his bawdy language, and his rolling gait was a give giveaway on the waterfront at Chatham. His name was duly entered into the muster roll early in March. HMS Harridge was a fourth-rate man of war, 976 tons, 50 guns, a length of 140 feet, and a crew of 300. For a month, John suffered cruelly as new crew members were literally beaten into submission. Admiral Vernon, one of the more humane admirals of his time, commented, I quote, our fleets are defrauded by injustice, marred by violence, and maintained by cruelty. Food was almost inedible, water foul, discipline harsh, vir escape virtually impossible. And yet because his father was a merchant sea captain and Newton himself had already been to sea with his father, he was soon promoted as midshipman. On the 24th of January, 1745, John, just off a four-hour watch and at one o'clock in the morning, found a space somewhere on the cramped crew quarters to write a letter. He began, Dear Polly, this is the first letter we have from Newton's pen, and it's a warm, flowing, passionate, 18th century love letter, which closed, I am your most faithful, devoted admirer, Newton. And it ended with a wonderful flourish of squiggles. John was turned 19 and far removed from his mother's Christian faith. Mary Catlett, whom he nicknamed Polly, was just 16, two days before the letter was written. John was born on the 24th of July, 1725, at a little village called Wapping, just a mile downriver from the Tower of London. His mother, Elizabeth, was married to a merchant captain living in Red Lion Street. She was a sincere Christian and a member of the independent chapel of Dr Jennings. 
John was brought up, therefore, on Bible stories and the hymns of Isaac Watts. Sadly, his mother died just before John's seventh birthday, and by the age of 11, he was at sea with his father. Two years of inferior schooling was all that he ever had. Dr. Johnson, the great uh, lexographer, uh, said uh, of Wapping that one day one had only to visit the place, quote, to see such modes of life that one could scarcely imagine. Well, before he was the age of 11, John had seen all those modes of life. He could walk down the end of his street and at execution dock, as it was known, he could watch mutineers and pirates hanging in chains until three tides had washed over them. In 1742, John's father had arranged for him to take a job in Jamaica, and with time to kill beforehand, he visited the family of Mr. and Mrs. Catlett in Chatham, uh, in whose home Elizabeth Newton had died. They had six children, and Mary, the eldest girl, was almost 14 years when he first met her. As soon as John saw her, he fell madly in love with his Polly, a love that he claimed exceeded all that the Romantics ever thought of, and it remained true and steadfast and unwavering until Mary's death almost 50 years later. But from now on, his life became a tangled web of romance, impetuous action and unbelief. John missed his boat to Jamaica, angered his father, visited Chatham as often as he could, overstayed his welcome, had no career to offer Mary or impress her parents, and finally, for his stupidity, he was himself impressed into His Majesty's Navy. When he wrote that passionate love letter in January 1745, John Newton had been converted to a free-thinking deist. That is, if there is a God, and we cannot know if there is, he's unconcerned, unconnected with this world. And therefore, from now on, morality was for John Newton to decide. He would plan his own life. The Bible stories and the hymns of Isaac Watts were things of the past. John Newton became an evangelist for unbelief. Years later, he wrote in his diary on the 21st of March, 1757, I quote, I was at that time a sinner beyond the common measure of men, having fallen from a pretty close outward profession of the gospel into the blackest apostasy, so that at the age of 22, or rather much sooner, I not only took counsel with the ungodly and walked in the way of sinners, but I was set in the seat of the scorner. I had lived for about four years, not a denier only, but a despiser of the gospel, venting the most outrageous blasphemies in all companies and upon all occasions, speaking of redemption, that amazing display of divine love, wisdom and power as an unholy, insignificant thing and the person of my ever-blessed and gracious Redeemer as an imposter. In all this time, I believe I never was in the company of any person that made the least pretense of a religious life, but I either endeavoured to laugh him out of it, or if that failed, scorned him in my heart. Never opened or spoke of the scriptures, but in order to introduce a profane jest upon them. Never spent half an hour with anyone with freedom, but I tempted him to sin. For my practice was as vile and abominable as my principles." so that I not only, as many others, indulge youthful sallies, as they are called by some, but lived in the habitual practice of every vice in which my age and circumstances were capable, theft and drunkenness only excepted. And in all these, I was a ringleader and a seducer of others. The thought of five years' separation from Mary was too much for John, and shortly after that love letter was written, John Newton deserted his ship. He was recaptured by dragoons and Captain Carter had ordered what was known then as a red-checked shirt on the grating. Twenty-five to thirty lashes across his bare back, after which he was carried below where his wounds were cauterized with vinegar, neat spirit, salt water or hot tar. And for days he was in a delirium. In May 1745, the fleet was anchored at Madeira and Newton managed to get himself exchanged for a seaman from a small merchant ship called the Pegasus. And this was possibly his introduction to slavery. 
The Pegasus was outward bound for Sierra Leone and the adjacent parts of the West African coast. If the Pegasus was a slave trader, her cargo was composed of an uninteresting assortment of lead, copper kettles, brass pans, ladles, basins, boilers, guns, gunpowder, knives, and other miscellaneous items. And then, darkly start, stored away in her hold, was a grisly array of chains, shackles, neck collars, leg and handcuffs and thumbscrews. Part of her cargo was the money with which to purchase slaves from the local traders on the West African coast, and the other part was the means by which the slaves were kept in order during the fearful second leg of the trade mission from Africa to the West Indies or the Americas, a journey often exceeding seven weeks. Having offloaded the slaves, the ship would then take on sugar, ginger, rum, pearls, cotton, and all the other commodities eagerly awaited by the British consumers, and it would return home across the final leg of the Atlantic Ocean. It's what became known as the triangular trade. From England to Africa with items for barter, from Africa to the West Indies or the American colon colonies with merchandise for the home market, uh, for uh, the slaves, and then from the West Indies back to England with merchandise for the home market. John Newton was to become very familiar with this triangular trade, which would generally take somewhere between 12 and 14 months to complete. It was considered at the time, I quote, a genteel occupation. He might have done well, but he worked for an unscrupulous trader and he became a virtual slave himself and the pity of slaves. In fact, he sank so low that he dabbled in animism, at one time even worshipped the moon, and was in the parlance of the time a white man become black. He lived and believed like the natives. In February 1747, by a quite remarkable coincidence, he found himself on board a merchant ship, the Greyhound, bound for England. Only his love for Mary and a blatant lie from the ship's captain actually made him head for home. He soon angered the captain by his foul language and bawdy songs, which often ridiculed both the ship and the captain without mentioning either of them by name. But of course, by the same token, he was very popular with the crew. Halfway across the Atlantic, disaster hit the little ship. On the 10th of March, 1748, a fierce storm shattered the mast and rigging, and the little ship was only kept afloat by her cargo of timber and beeswax. Newton joked that it would be something to laugh over a jug of beer when they arrived at port, to which a sailor on board responded, oh no, no, it's too late now. And that, for some reason, went through Newton like a knife. For the first time since a childhood, Newton found himself praying. Lashed to the wheel or working the pumps gave him time to think. Involuntarily, he repeated the words that he had learned from his mother, Proverbs 1, 23, all the way through 31, and his memory seemed aided as he muttered above the wind and the torn canvas these condemning words. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man has regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you. Then they shall call me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Finally, after days of anguish and torture of mind, hope and peace flooded in as he put his wavering trust in Christ alone. He later wrote, On that day the Lord sent from on high and delivered me out of deep waters. The greyhound, broken and barely afloat, arrived off Ireland in Loch Swilly, appropriately on Good Friday, the 8th of April, 1748. Once back on the mainland, of course, his first action was to call on Mary, but he still had nothing to offer her. However, bless her, she was willing to wait, but she gave him very little hope beyond that. 